Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to the ZFS Club webinar. Uh, this is one of our community's chess series, uh, and this is where we we ask somebody in our community to kind of tell us what's on their what's on their mind uh, and get something off of their chest. And today we're absolutely delighted to have Ekoswehi Iahan, who is the Secretary General of the Insurance Development Forum. Uh, she will develop a theme uh, as we go along, but it's a, a very, very important theme. She's going to be looking particularly at the public-private partnerships in insurance. And I think there's a tremendous amount that we have to learn today about thinking uh, forward uh, post-pandemic, but post other risks as well. Uh, before we begin, uh, you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the <coughs> directors of Zien, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce these webinars and to get to chat to such fantastic guests. But I couldn't do any of this without our sponsors, and our sponsors are an enormously uh, kind group of people who allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today we're going to be certainly looking at economics and finance and risk. Uh, <clears throat> do have a good look at our sponsors. Uh, they're very involved in all of those areas, and we will come back to thank them again uh, more appropriately at the end. So what are we going to do today? Well, my job is to get out of the way and let you uh, listen to our guests, and we're going to have a conversation here. Please uh, contribute to that conversation by asking your questions via the GoToWebinar chat facility. Um, once in a while, people email me their questions. That's not going to be much use because I'm here with you. And I won't get the email till later. So uh, please do use the chat facility, and I will feed these into a discussion uh, with Echo Swayi, which I think is going to be absolutely fascinating. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, now, Echo Swayi, uh heads up the uh, Insurance Development Forum. And I'm going to let her explain, in her own words, what that's all about. Echo Sway, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Michael, for, for really an opportunity to exchange with you um, and also this audience. It's really a, a delight. Uh, and I'm here to also learn because there's tremendous expertise here, more than, you know, uh, I certainly have. And so this is also a learning for me. So really thank you for the opportunity to have this exchange. Um, as you said, I'd like to just uh, give you a little bit of introduction to the IDF. Uh, because it's also central to the theme that we are discussing today, which is public-private uh, partnerships in the context of uh, the insurance industry, but also as we think about resilience. Uh, so the IDF itself, um, as was mentioned, not to overuse the term, but is a public-private partnership uh, that brings together the insurance industry with the public sector, specifically the World Bank and the United Nations, to really address the issue of the protection gap. And more specifically, how do we engage the insurance industry or to harness the capacities and skills that exist within the insurance um, industry to help achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, and within that, we can look at, okay, health issues, you know, issues around climate risk, which has really been a priority for the IDF. Um, but importantly, it's also about contributing to the G7, G20 goal of having 500 million people, vulnerable people insured by 2025. Um, and for us, this means really fostering a coalition between industry and the public sector to help us to address these issues. Because uh, the insurance industry, I mean, has contributed significantly when we think about how the world thinks about risk and manages risk. Um, but is there an opportunity to do more, given the kind of context that we are all faced with today with COVID and climate change, et cetera? And so that really is at the heart of our mandate. Um, next slide, please. Yes. Um, and again, this is just to give you a sense of the timeline in terms of the launch of the IDF. Um, it was formally launched in two, in, at COP21 um, in Paris by Mike McGavick. I think uh, a lot of you who might be on the line from the industry would know him, former C sorry, CEO of Excel Catling. Um, and in two th following that, um, I think that, again, most of you will know some of these uh, industry titans. Stephen Catlin uh, was appointed as the chair of the IDF. Um, in 2016 and co-chaired with Helen Clark, who was the head of UNDP, and Joaquim Levy, who was the managing director of the World Bank. Um, and at that point in time, there was quite a lot of thought and engagement that went uh, into engaging with different UN institutions, public institutions, and across the industry around this agenda. And from that, we focused on five areas where we thought that the IDF could really add value. Um, these being risk modeling, law, regulation, and resilience policies, uh, 
um, really focusing on how do we develop new trans new solutions, so a sovereign and humanitarian solutions group, an inclusive insurance uh, working group, as well as an investments working group. Um, in 2018, um, there was a shift in terms of the governance with Denny Duvern taking on the chair Manship role of the IDF and Denny Duvern being the chairman of AXA. Um, and again, obviously, Akim Steiner from UNDP, um, as well as Hiroshi Matano, who is the head of the multilateral investment guarantee agency of the World Bank Group. Um, but obviously, beyond that, there are others who are engaged within the IDF. And since 2018, there's been a, a, a concerted effort to transition into making this idea that we have into a much more operational endeavor. So crowding in actors from the insurance industry, from the public sector, to engage with governments around this challenge. Next slide, please. And again, just to give you a sense of the structure of the IDF, as I mentioned, we have, uh, it's chaired by Denis Duverne of AXA and co-chaired by the World Bank and the UNDP. Uh, but you also have a steering committee where you have CEOs and uh, chairpersons from various instit international institutions and companies uh, who give a steer in terms of the direction and the issues that the IDF should be focused in focused on. Um, it's obviously supported by the op an operating committee, also senior executives from within the industry and public sector institutions that could help to drive how we put this um, endeavor into operation. And then finally, uh, we then have our working groups where we have over 200 um, people from various companies and institutions really trying uh, to address uh, the different um, issues that might emerge in each of the, the working groups. Uh, personally, I'm the secretary general of the secretariat. So really supporting the steering committee, the operating committee and the working group uh, to really move this agenda forward. So that hopefully gives you a sense of the mandate of the IDF, our structure, um, our history uh, and what we are really trying to achieve here. So the next slide. Yes, yes. so we thought we'd uh, have a little kind of a brain teaser, didn't we, Eka Swahi, just to get the audience engaged. So folks, uh, fingers on buzzers. Uh, Echo say I'd like you just to kind of estimate the total losses as a result of natural disasters uh, since 1980. You know, is it uh, 5,200 billion, 1,200 billion, or 8,900 billion? And yes, just to keep the brains active, we did sort of scramble the numbers a little bit. Uh, so here you go. You can just uh, use the GoToWebinar facility to answer the question. <clears throat> wow, that's a fast audience. Uh, Seven seconds, over half of them had voted. Okay, that's great. <laughs> great. Just give it another few seconds there for those who are using this for the first time. That's super. And I'll now share the poll results. Okay. <laughs> well, do, do you want to reveal the answer? <laughs> yes, I'll reveal the answer. The answer is A. So it's uh, it's really interesting to see the split. <laughs> um, yes. I'm comforted in a sense, in, it, it, it indicates that there is quite a bit of awareness of uh, issue around the protection gap. So I, I'm pleased with that answer. And I know that it was quite difficult to deliberately uh, mix up the order <laughs> to see who was really you know alert at this time. Good. But actually, that was just to get the brain going for the second poll, wasn't it? Yes. So really, the question is out of that loss, whatever the number was. What percentage of those losses have been insured? And that's probably the real question here. I'm now going to launch that poll. So is it A, more than 70%, B, less than 30%, or C, more than 40%? Again, Neko Swahi uh, has made sure your brain has to be a bit active on this one, too. It's super, and wow, everybody has pretty much voted. Okay. And here we go again. I'll just close that poll and share the results. Excellent. So I think most most people on the line clearly. <laughs> so less than thirty percent. So we're very much underusing uh, one tool that we we like to think is there all the time, don't we? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for for the responses. I, I think this what this indicates to me is that we have a great audience who's already plugged into the issue, so we can get into the real substance and and the meat around this. Um, and again, I just included this slide because I thought, okay, the protection gap, depending on the audience, everybody might not be as plugged in. Uh, but essentially, when we talk about the insurance protection gap, it's really the difference between economic losses caused by disasters, 
and the amounts of those losses that are actually uh, covered by insurance coverage. Um, and again, I think many of you are familiar with the reports that are produced annually by many of the big uh, insurance companies around the protection gap. Here we have from Lloyd's, um, from their 2018 reports, the size of global insurance protection gap in emerging um, economies, um, accounting for uh, 160 billion or 96% of this. But also an important figure here, which is the 1%, the percentage of natural disaster losses in developing countries between 1980 and 2004 that were insured. Um, and this is compared to 30% in developed countries. Uh, and I think that this hopefully highlights a, a problem here, but also an opportunity. And why aren't we capitalizing on this opportunity um, a little bit more, right? Um, and then finally, the four trillion figure, again, with, in, in line with the, the big numbers that we've, saw, we've, we've seen in previous slides and in the poll, uh, the estimated figure loss to extreme and natural disaster events globally over the past 40 years. Um, and 2.9 trillion of which was uninsured. So I, this, this really, I think, um, highlights the challenge that we have in front of us. Um, please, next slide. And that, that is an amazing gap, isn't it? So you're basically saying 1% coverage in developing world and 30%. We, we would see ourselves as underinsured. So that is just an absolutely gargantuan uh, gap indeed. Wow. Yes. And then it also, I think, I hope it also prompts some reflection on what does that mean for the people that are actually affected by these disasters if access to insurance is not even an option or a thought, right? Um, who is managing that risk? How is that risk being managed by individuals, by businesses, by governments as well? Um, and the risk sits on the balance sheet, it's there. So it's a matter of how are you managing, how are you paying for it? Um, and another issue, I, another dimension that I wanted to also highlight was the humanitarian context, which is, um, when you do have these events, there's usually a, a significant mobilization by the international community to respond. Um, but even in that context, there are gaps in financing, right? Um, and so this is a number from last year from UN OCHA, a funding requirements of 29.7 billion, and that's not only climate events, that's also um, conflict, etc. A funding received 15.96, and uh, obviously 54. That's only 54 percent. So again, there's this mismatch. Uh, between um, how are we protecting society? Uh, what are the tools that people have accessible to them in terms of pro um, protection? And how are we thinking about funding the response to these disasters? But I think that all of us can also acknowledge that generally there are challenges within the, the, the system to support financing response to these events when they do occur. Poor preparedness planning, under investments in data and systems for response, um, under investments in adaptation and risk reduction. When the response actually comes, sometimes it is slow, it's politicized, <laughs> fragmented, and there's also limited learning. We keep doing the same things over and over and over again. Uh, why aren't we seeing the kind of improvements that we need and we can, we can, we can affect? Um, what are the challenges in actually getting that done? Next slide, please. Uh, just before we do that, uh, I can say Hugh Purser has a question here. He was curious, uh, sort of in between these two slides, what, what is the gap between the value of that which is insured compared to what is paid out? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I would have to, to look into that to try and figure out. To, I, I wouldn't want to give you um, wrong information, but it's a good question. Um, and we have later on in my, in my presentation, I will touch on some slides where we do look at the establishment of these uh, PPPs and how they've performed in terms of um, payouts to these communities and what do these payouts mean? Um, for these communities. Okay. Um, another, another, sorry. I, um, you'll be getting um, emails, of, of the emails of anybody who asks a question. So, uh, Hugh, we will be able to get back to you. Okay, yeah. great. Um, and again, I just wanted to highlight this slide because um, to emphasize the point, which is that we have the protection gap, but we also have a situation where those who need it the most are actually the ones with the least access, right? Uh, so the countries that are facing tremendous impacts in terms of climate impacts, et cetera, is also where we see limited insurance access. And so this also poses quite some significant questions, I think, uh, for industry, but also for the public sector uh, about how are we really thinking about supporting uh, these vulnerable countries and communities. And so this slide is really to provide some kind of uh, a reflection on that. Um, and one of the, the statistics there is coastal flooding exposure in Asia. Um, in 2005, the analysis showed one in, one Asian city in the top 10 in terms of risk to, to coastal flooding. By 2070, 2070, that will be 
eight Asian cities will be in, in that top 10. So it's a, it's a huge risk and it's a huge challenge ahead of us. And so it's also, you know, something to, to think about when we think about also the volume in terms of the people that will be exposed and also the impact on economies as a result of this. Next slide, please. So again, one of the things that I also like to reflect on is that when we think about resilience or thinking about how do we better manage these risks, finance is obviously a very important part of the picture, right? But there is also a supporting infrastructure that needs to be there. There is the need for risk awareness and understanding. How well do people understand these risks? I always say there is a difference between data and information that I can make decision on. So you can have as much data as you like, but if that doesn't allow the policy maker or the decision maker to actually use that information to make decisions, to, 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 to undertake the trade-offs that often exist, then you kind of miss the point of that effort. There's also a need for concerted consideration around how are we investing in prevention and risk reduction. The finance is important, but the risk reduction and the prevention is just as important in order to even make the finance effective, right? Um, and then there's also the question around how are we, again, not to keep emphasizing the point, but response to disasters. What does that look like, right? How are we financing that in the short, the medium, the long term? What does a recovery look like? We've heard a lot of reference to build back better. What does that mean? How is that financed? Um, how are we using, again, evidence to support decision making? Are we leaving that to a political process? You know, what does that look like um, in various countries um, across the world? And then also finance being an element of this. How can we ensure that there is actually financing available when you do have these events? And for me, I think that the insurance industry has a tremendous role to play here. Um, and I think about the industry, not just simply in terms of, okay, it's underwriting capacity, the products and tools, but really thinking about it in its full breadth, which is, from the regulatory element, how are we leveraging the industry as a regulated industry to support resilient thinking um, around the globe? From the skills and the tools that exist within the industry around risk understanding, how are we using that information to support this agenda? And so I think that there is a lot of capacity that sits within the industry that frankly hasn't been deployed in an effective, uh, in as a, an effective enough uh, manner as it could to support the challenges that we see ahead of us. And so for us within the IDF, it's really to think about how do we begin to engage those communities? When we look at the 1% that don't think about insurance, how do they understand the value proposition in order to address their development objectives? And that really is for us an interesting nexus where we think that there is a lot of scope for public-private um, partnerships. It's, it's interesting this, isn't it? I, I mean, if this were a slide for many other sectors or industries, it would be look at this enormous opportunity. Um, but I'm also sort of thinking about it from, the, you know, let's imagine I'm a, a CEO of, a, of an insurance organization. I look at this, um, but I, I just kind of don't know how to get started. Uh, I've got to figure out regulation. I've got to look at, uh, you know, is my product actually genuinely pooling or am I concentrating my risks, et cetera? But when you raise this argument with chief executives, what's their reaction? Yeah, um, I think that there is a we we are increasingly seeing a recognition that there is an opportunity here. Um, and again, when we look at you know fast emerging markets, right? Uh, there's also an increasing appetite within governments to say, okay, how are we leveraging insurance? Uh, small businesses, right? How do we make them more resilient, right? But it's not an easy task, and some of my subsequent slides will speak to that, right? Because it also means a process of engagement, right, with these communities around insurance. It also means maybe slightly different products, um, because maybe the products that we are accustomed to just pulling off the shelf and, you know, presenting to customers might not be might not be the things that resonate with some of these communities, right? It might require a little bit of investment in innovative new products. That's why we've seen the emergence of things like parametric insurance uh, that that might be more relevant in these communities. So there is a little bit of an investment that needs to go into it, uh, an investment in terms of new products, new ways of engaging with these communities, new tools, et cetera. But it also means a conversation with the public sector, um, because for many of these countries, the engagement with the World Bank or the UN is quite a significant one. But how do those institutions speak about risk to these governments? Uh, how do they really advocate for what the opportunities are? Um, this is also an area that we feel we believe that there is a lot more work to be done there. 
Um, just before we move along, uh, Tanji Morgan's got a, a, an interesting question. Do you think that the current zeitgeist of ESG, environmental social governance, will move your agenda forward? Yes, uh, I believe so, absolutely. And we've actually started to see that. <laughs> um, because I think that um, a lot of institutions are waking up to the fact that there is there is a responsibility there, right, that they have, and it's good for business, right? Um, and so there are that is also a channel through which I think that we are seeing uh, a, an awakening in many corners of how do we really lean in in a meaningful way. And one of the things again that I will touch on is creating public, creating value, right? Value for companies in a new era that we are faced with and value for the communities that you exist in as well. Uh, because I think that one of the challenges that we, we, we have to contend with, with is the questions around relevance, <laughs> right? Uh, mm. people, people don't understand or have access to your products or know what you're offering. Then your relevance <laughs> is limited in that particular context. And so these are some of the challenges that I think these conversations around ESG really help to bo bolster um, because it, it forces more of a reflection on how can we do better uh, with, within our institutions, but also in our engagements with others. So we've got this enormous gap and uh, we need a bit of structure to, to pull it in. And you've been chatting about public-private partnerships. So uh, I, I know the audience is, is really interested in this. Yeah. And I thought that I would highlight uh, an example from Ghana where, you know, we have a government there that expressed huge interest in working with industry um, to develop a, a product for flood risk in the capital, Accra. And one would think, oh, this is great, you know, fantastic, let's try, right? But it's complex, right? And especially when you look at a developing country context, it's a challenging situation um, in terms of how do you take a request and translate into something that is actually insurable, right? And so what does that look like? Um, when we, for, for um, Allianz, who's been engaged with the GIZ, which is uh, a, an entity that's um, a German government funded entity around this issue, uh, they recognize you have a situation where there's a lack of accessible historical data, um, despite frequent floods, patchy hazard and exposure information, the risk is not quantified. Again, the difference between data versus meaningful data, um, outdated public assets registry, um, and also when we think about risk reduction, what are the issues there? What are the vulnerabilities? What are the exposures, challenges with waste management and blocked drains? Um, these are fundamentals, right? Um, and then when it comes to issues around understanding the risk, how then do we improve? We have to improve a base understanding of what that risk is. So a need to update public assets registry. Who does that? Who funds that? <laughs> you know, how is that done? Is there the technical capacity to do it? Um, hazard and exposure analysis. Uh, and the development of risk profiles of all public assets. That's a lot of work, right? But if it's done, it could also be quite, um, I think, a, a huge opportunity in terms of new business lines. Uh, can we also, we need to do cost benefit analysis of identified risk reduction measures uh, so that again, we can have informed discussions around what are the trade-offs? You know, how much should we be investing in risk reduction efforts versus other kinds of initiatives? And then also importantly, how are we leveraging technology? Because that's also a big part of this equation, technology. How does technology factor in all of this, right? Uh, we also see in markets where customers are very plugged into their smartphones. Are we doing enough <laughs> uh, to, to leverage that, to improve understanding of risk, but also the provision of new products and tools? Um, and so all of that, when we talk about translating a demand into something that we can actually take to market, is quite a heavy lift. Um, and one that, you know, corporates alone cannot do, but also requires significant investment by the public sector ultimately as well. And so what is the structure that would allow for that to be done? And so I just included this slide to give you a sense of, you know, some of the challenges that we actually encounter when we engage in some of these projects where there is a demand, but it's not so easy to translate it into something that is, um, you know, in insurable for the particular government. Or it will take time is also the other point. Um, a couple of people have um, picked up on this slide. I, I, I know we want to move ahead, but the the interesting element here is the inclusion of politics in this. You know that this is a public-private, so we tend to think in the developed world that there's less of a an interference of the government. And here, you know, you're in there with Morocco, you're in there with Ghana, you're in there with developing nations. 
Uh, Bob McDowell is curious, you know, is, is there a danger here that you're insuring the uninsurable? Uh, he also sort of wonders, uh, does this lead to <clears throat> insurance having a role in shaping and reforming the structures and enterprise because it's directing or mandating how insurance compensation is deployed? Um, so how do you get that appropriate balance between what is meant to be a market solution, but the very fact that you need uh, to involve politics to move forward from that 1%? Yeah, and, and, and this is where it's, uh, again, to the heart of PPPs. What does it look like? Um, the reality is that for many of these countries, governments drive <laughs> the direction, right? Um, and so there is a conversation that you have to have. It's a journey. That's how I would characterize it. Um, it's a journey that you have to walk with these governments to understand what is insurable versus what isn't, right? Um, there's also, I would say, to the point I raised earlier, also limited understanding sometimes of you know what where is the value proposition of insurance it's, it's insurance you cannot use a, a risk transfer tool to cover the entire losses from a disaster but what parts of that of those losses do you want to use the insurance for right what is the most efficient and then how does that balance with other investments that you need to be making and these are not conversations that the industry can have in isolation right mm -hmm. similarly when the government is thinking or the appetite as we are seeing that it's open up opening up amongst um within uh, amongst various governments around risk is really to try to understand where is the value proposition because i have a limited uh, budget right limited financing so what where does it make sense and again to the point of how do we foster open transparent collaboration that would allow for a recognition of where that value is and where it isn't, <laughs> right? And then what also is the cost of that? So what's the cost of inaction? What's the cost of the insurance? What's the cost associated with other types of risk financing instruments so that I can then make a, a decision? And then there's also the issue of timelines around this. We're also not talking about processes where it's about a transaction today. It's about a system, <laughs> right? Because you want governments that are engaged in this for the long term. We're also talking about how do we develop markets? And this is not something that you do overnight. So the, the discussions that we have with these governments, yes, it might be focused on, okay, in, in Ghana, how do we address flood, the flood issue there? But it's a little bit more than that. And this slide I think I've, I've included to help uh, give some perspective um, despite the challenges, we're also seeing quite a bit of interest um, and emerging programs and schemes right around the, the world, um, ranging from, you know, a, a continental risk pool in Africa, the Caribbean catastrophe risk pool, some really interesting initiatives in the Philippines, um, in Indonesia focused on public assets. And so we're seeing an increasing appetite to engage, um, to learn, to understand um, but again, this is also these these many of these efforts are not things that happened overnight. There were projects that ran for several years. And so this is also the understanding that needs to take place within the private sector around the complexity of the issue, but also a reconciliation of the timelines that might be that, that would be needed to kind of get from an initial conversation to um, transactions. Now, you're going to give us an example, weren't you, um, starting with the, an African one? Yes, uh, I was going to give uh, the example of the African risk capacity. And this was really born out of uh, a concern that emerged at the African Union level and also with the WFP, which is the World Food Program, where every couple of years you'd have these droughts in East Africa, you know, West, Af West Africa, Southern Africa, um, a need to mobilize significant resources by the humanitarian community to respond. And so one of the talking about learnings, one of the things that the African Union and the World Food Program noted was the experience in the Caribbean, where you had these countries that affected by hurricanes and, and um, earthquakes pooled their risk across the Caribbean region into a single portfolio to then access in a much more efficient way um, the reinsurance market. And so the question for the African Union and WFP was, could we do a similar thing for the African continent, but focused on drought? And so there was a lot of work that had to go into, number one, developing a customized early warning system, an early warning system that was also built on a model of trying to tease out for this government, what does it mean in terms of drought impact, in terms of uh, impact on the government, but also impact on livelihoods. And what we saw was that for many communities, when you do have a drought, it's not only the loss of food, it's a loss of livelihood, it's people, it's children being pulled out of school, 
you know. Uh, so there is a longer term impact that could be quite significant when you talk about development. And so we had to really reflect on this with the government in order to also understand the cost of the insurance ultimately and how that sits in a broader liability that you are faced with. Uh, another element that we also thought would be important within the ARC was not just saying, okay, here is an insurance solution, which at the time was a, a parametric insurance that will, would allow for early triggering, but how can we proactively link that to contingency plans? So before the government accesses the insurance, um, insurance product, sitting down with them to try to understand if you had an event that triggered your policy, how would you actually use the money, right? What programs would you use what programs would you scale up? Are there existing social safety net programs? If it's school feeding programs, all, um, you know, procurement for, for food, all of those different things. Can you prearrange this before the events so that once we know that an event has occurred, we automatically can trigger the funding to scale up those programs to get to the response to people? And so what happens is that traditionally, when you have a drought in, in many of these countries across the African continent, you have the end of the season. Resources only get to these communities six to nine months after the disaster because the, the impact of drought is not immediately visible. So you have to wait six months to see people suffering. And then that is then what is used to mobilize resources. Uh, it takes time to mobilize that with the international community before the farmer gets it. And so our idea was, no, we can actually significantly shrink that period. We know when an event occurs, we know what systems are in place within these countries to get to people who need it. We also have innovative developments in the insurance markets in terms of insurance products. Why can't we link it? We can pull the risk across the continent as well to support diversification to allow us to get those resources out earlier. And we did an analysis with uh, Oxford University to look at uh, uh, on the cost benefit around this. And what we saw is $1 spent through ARC saves $4.40 in post-disaster response. Um, and for the government, again, this was remarkable because it was, okay, this is actually much more cost efficient. So why can't we do more of this? Uh, Henry Winnon, uh, we've got quite a few questions here, actually. Henry Winnon is curious about uh, how, if you could expand on how uh, parametric risk transfer products work here. Okay. So in this in, uh, parametric it, it, um, products is basically looking at a particular hazard and trying to beforehand estimate the magnitude of the event and what are the expected losses that we can attach to the magnitude of this event. So perhaps uh, tropical cyclones might be easier. Um, there's a standard classification category one, two, three, four, five of tropical cyclones, right? Um, you can do a lot of work beforehand in terms of understanding the risk of what is the exposure in a particular country? What are the buildings like, right? Um, what is the, the structure of the economy? Is it primarily services based or, you know, uh, based on agriculture or whatever? Um, if you do have an event, how, how has that impacted the ability of the state to function or people to recover? And you can then say, okay, from a category one, we can expect X amount of losses. From a category two, it's another set of losses. And you can actually link that to say, okay, if a government is hit by a well, a government will make a choice. When we are affected by a category three, we expect our insurance policy to pay out. And so what happens is that immediately when you do have these events, you can have an objective assessment of what the, what the impact is and a payout linked to that. And so we don't have to then go through a lengthy process of loss adjustment and all of that to determine what the payout is. And so there is an element of speed of receipt of the finance of the of the funding that the governments are also interested in because the earlier they can respond, the, the, the more it saves the communities and it, the, the, it reduces the overall impact on, on them. And so that's the, the, I think the innovation of the parametric insurance product um, is also really looking at or, or coupling or harnessing the information that we have to develop products that are able to respond much faster. But I would say that there are also challenges because it's, the, we have issues around basis risk where you have situations where um, the models might reflect a loss that might not necessarily be the same as what we see on the ground. Um, and this can go both ways. It can overestimate or underestimate. And then how do you manage that? Because that's also an issue in terms of these, um, the innovation around parametrics. Yeah, very much the need to work with, with your partners there.
<laughs> Henri also goes on to point out, and I don't think we have time for this, but that uh, you know, there's some this type of parametric approach, which not only, as you point out, brings it forward, it's more akin to a bet in a way. Um, also allows uh, insurance linked security markets to develop, which of course deepens the pool of available capital, which I, I think is a is a very very important point. Um, yeah. Would you like to talk to this slide? Would you like me to move on to the next one? Um, I. I I would I would just spend a few a little bit of time on these slides and I and this was provided by our kind colleagues members of the IDF Swiss Re, and it was a really a reflection from the corporate side of you know how do they see this issue around engaging in markets in emerging markets around this issue um, and for them they identified three pillars which they thought was really quite important um, risk awareness and understanding maybe low prevention and risk reduction is top of mind for the governments as well risk transfer is optional. <laughs> for many of these uh, contexts, it is optional. Uh, and so this is for me is an important point because it also is at the heart of maybe why we are seeing uh, such low insurance penetration because oftentimes these governments defer to other types of products and tools, which might not always be the most efficient, right? Um, and so it's also a case of really having to make the case for why it is important and its relevance and its efficiency from a financing and also supporting response perspective. Um, and then I would just go to the, the second pillar, which is working with partners, a need that they have seen in the work that they've been engaging across the globe to engage with local partners, um, the, the important role of IFIs and development organizations, uh, the role of technology in this process. And then finally, some reflections which I thought were useful from a corporate perspective was they had to do quite a bit of work internally in terms of really getting top management, engagement and commitment, and to see this as a long term investment. Um, and the fact that for a lot of these ventures, there was also quite a, a bit of work done in terms of undertaking a, the commercial rationale for or sustainability for these programs, because that is also an important element of, of why we engage, of, of how to engage with these with governments, is that this is not a, a, a one an annual a one year initiative or a project in that sense, but it's really a long term um, venture that must also be commercially viable, and then also a managing the broad pi a, a pipeline, right? Where success rate can be low. Um, there might be governments that might express a demand, but then when it comes to actually engaging within the transactions, might not necessarily translate as quickly. And then this slide, again, quite a, a lot of um, information, but hopefully I think you will all get this slide so you can reflect on it. But I just wanted to identify or elaborate rather on the five areas within the IDF that we focus on. Um, as I mentioned, risk modeling being an important one, um, law regulation, but also sovereign and humanitarian and inclusive insurance. How are we investing in actual development of insurance solutions, innovative products that are needed? And finally, um, on investments, which is increasing the sectors and countries within which insurance investments can operate um, to support um, resilience infrastructure. Next slide, please. Okay. And then just quickly on this slide, um, in terms of the IDF and how we've sought to address this, uh, last year at the UN Climate Summit, we launched a program with the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, and BMZ, which is the German government, to roll out a program of technical assistance for 20 countries, um, and really to begin to accelerate how our engagement with these countries around their risk financing needs. And this is quite significant because it was really bringing together partners um, in new and in interesting ways. The UNDP, they have a presence in 157 countries around the world. Uh, they engage with governments around their national adaptation plans, um, their national uh, financing strategies, et cetera. And so part of this effort is to work with UNDP to say, okay, how can insurance feature more prominently in that? And to help also build understanding on the, of the value proposition around insurance. Um, the BMZ obviously provided some financing for the technical assistance program and delivery, and the insurance industry also committed to supporting the development of the infrastructure, the risk modeling infrastructure to support provision of better risk information, um, but also to co-invest with the BMZ in the technical assistance program with these, with, with these governments. And finally, the offer of $5 billion um, US dollars in offered risk capacity. And so for us, this was actually quite an innovative a partnership between an international institution such as the UNDP, the German government, which is a donor, and also the industry to engage in a, in a collaborative way um, with a, a group of countries where we are seeing a demand for these kinds of um, engagement. Next slide. 
Um, and then practically, what does this translate to? Again, a project that has come out of, of that initiative that we launched last year is in Peru, where the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Finance were interested in working with the IDF to set up an insurance program for 50,000 public schools. Um, after the El Nino event in 2017, they faced significant challenges in terms of really the rebuild of some of those schools. And so the challenge was how can we have an insurance a product for coverage for the infrastructure, but importantly, working with them in the period before that, right? So how do we plan better in terms of structuring uh, procurement processes before the, these events occur? How do we leverage technology in terms of building an asset base of what this what this public infrastructure looks like, right? Um, how do we leverage technology in terms of improving our claims administration process? So for us, this is quite an interesting uh, project and it's the kind of thing that we want to do more of within the IDF with, with governments. Um, we're talking about schools, critical public assets, impact on education, um, which can also be quite profound when we talk about the social um, impact of disasters. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the things that we work on. Next this is amazing. I mean, what you it, it, it really is a very, um, re really amazing program. You're, you're using markets to do good. And for an organization that's not even six years old, you seem to have achieved a heck of a lot uh, <laughs> out there. Um, I, I think what, what I like is the, is the very pragmatic approach here. Uh, we've got a number of questions. I, um, we're quite short of time, but I'm, I'm going to tackle one, if you don't mind. There's been a lot of talk uh, post COVID that uh, we, we should have a more developed risk structure in developing countries. Uh, Liz Foster is on the line here. She's uh, behind something called TOTUS RE, TOTUS RE Insurance, which is saying you shouldn't be picking off uh, specific risk governments. You should look at your entire risk portfolio and develop an overall solution. Um, now, it's sad in some ways because I don't, I don't know of any uh, Western country, if I call it that, that's really done that so far. They've done areas like uh, uh, terrorism in the case of Puri, or they've done flood or, or various things, but nobody's taken an, a holistic risk. In a sense, you're almost having a developing countries looking at more holistic risks, maybe with things to teach us here in the developed world. Is, is that is that a fair assessment? I think it's a, it's a fair assessment, but I, I would also be a little bit humble about it <laughs> um, in that it is something that we are promoting actively with many of these governments, um, because when we see the impacts, we have to, <laughs> right? Um, and you cannot look at these issues in isolation, and which is and which also adds to the complexity of it, right? Um, and you are dealing with institutions, well, governments that have limited budgets and competing interests. And so I remember vividly when I went to speak to a government in a in a particular country in in Africa, and the official said to me, "But Ekoswahi." This is really important with, with drought, but I'm also dealing with terrorism in, in a certain part of my country, and I have to put resources into that, right? Um, so there's an appetite to engage, but are we making the connection? So one of the things I was saying was that, yes, there's that issue that you're dealing with, but drought is important because when people don't have food, they are exposed <laughs> to other elements. They become desperate, right? And this forces them to engage in things that they might not otherwise engage in. So you have to think about what are the connections between security and the impacts you're seeing from climate change. And so when we engage with the government, yes, we might look at um, drought risk, but it also opens up a conversation for a much broader issue around how are you managing risk generally within your portfolio, within your budget, right? Um, mm -hmm. And this goes to the heart of, are we making information available <laughs> that supports that? Right? Are we engaging with the counterparts like the UNDP and the World Bank that put a lot of resources into their engagement with these governments around their development agendas? But how is that speaking to risk and managing risk in a proactive way and the financing of the risk? And this is the journey that we are working. Lots of challenges, complexities, uh, failures as well. I would, I would say that. Um, but I think that there is scope for learning from developed countries and also from, from developing countries. And so it goes to uh, a point that I, I had on that last slide, which was about public value, about generating value, right? Um, and this really also being at the heart of what we are, we are trying to achieve. Well, we could, we could go on. And I, I think what's particularly interesting in the West has been this recognition of late that the response to COVID involved monetary policy, you know, that it was, it's been a huge amount of quantitative easing. And, 
traditionally in the developing world that that's there's been a barrier monetary policy is meant to be managed in a very conservative way and everything else is therefore budgeted in almost a household sense uh, rather than the, the developed but what, what i found intriguing is some recent studies very recent uh, showing that developing countries seem to be able to issue uh, to, to, to undertake QE without devaluing their currency too much either. So there's maybe maybe a spread here where we're going to see a lot more commonality amongst these models than we have in the past. Yeah. Can say that that was fantastic, and I'm afraid we've run out of time. But I, I thought I'd read a somewhat lengthy comment, um, a compliment really. Uh, Robert Woodthorpe Brown, who's been in the insurance sector for many many years. Uh, points out that he convened the first African insurance conference in Mauritius, Mauritius in 1972, which resulted in the creation of the African Insurance Organization, recognized by the African Union. And he also, with UNCTAD, helped develop agricultural insurance models to allow farmers uh, to remain in business without state subsidy after disaster. Uh, and he, he feels that uh, you should be the keynote speaker at the 15th anniversary conference of the African Insurance uh, Conference, so a heck of a compliment from somebody who's been around the sector uh, for, for many for many ways. Um, now, if I, if I can, I'm afraid I, we, we've just come out of time and, and so many good compliments here. We'll feed those over to you. Um, but before we end, I've got to three rounds of thanks to do, as ever, uh, to our sponsors, many of whom I know care immensely about the insurance sector, and we'll be seeing this, hopefully, in the sense of opportunity as much as risk management. I'd like to as well uh, to thank our audience. Thank you very much for participating. And it's been quite fun, it's a, quite a specialist subject, but one that I think has enormous ramifications uh, for the sort of world that we want to live in in the future. Uh, but finally, of course, I have to thank you, Echo Say. You, uh, you're, you're so much fun to work with. Uh, I've had such a, such a, such a great time uh, warming up to this and also chatting with you. And I appreciate the effort you put in here to get your message across. And I'd encourage um, our our viewers to really engage with you in, in the idea because of what you're trying to achieve. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, in these days of COVID, I am unable to open the gates uh, of applause, but I can, in fact, uh, provide on behalf of the audience a little applause of meter here. Uh, this is my uh, Korean karmic clapper, so uh, sort of a Buddhist set of applause for you. Uh, but may I say thank you so much for appearing. And, you know, given the speed with which you're developing, I think we'd really like to to engage uh, and 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 see this story unfold. So hopefully, perhaps we can have you back next year uh, to update us on on the achievements. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you as well, Michael. Thank you to everyone.